everybody, and welcome to ACTV. I'm Andrew Cohen, and I'm very pleased and excited today because uh, I'm going to be speaking with uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, the great Steve McIntosh, and I'm going to be asking him about uh, a, a very interesting book project that he's working on. But uh, Steve and I have been uh, v friends, and I think we're very close friends by now, uh, for about five years. And I'm a, I'm a big admirer of his work. He is a he's a he's a brilliant thinker. And uh, every time I speak with Steve, I I feel that my um, my mind is becoming more informed and more integrated through the through his uh, very deep grasp of integral philosophy and inter integral thinking. So to tell you a little bit about Steve, Steve uh, uh, is a lawyer. He was a lawyer, and he's also an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a for, first and foremost. He's an integral philosopher, and Steve is the author of two books. His first book, which made a very big impression on, on me, was called Integral Consciousness, and his second book, which was released uh, a year ago, I think, October was uh, released in October, was called Evolution's Purpose. Uh, Steve's also the founder of a new think tank called the Institute for Cultural Evolution, and. Uh, I'm I'm a, a a board member of that uh, think tank. I'm very excited about the work of that think tank, and I think maybe Steve, we should maybe we should do one of these discussions together just about the think tank. That would probably be a great thing we could do together. That would be excellent. I'd appreciate that a lot. But the the reason we've come together today is because uh, S Steve and I were having a informal conversation a couple of days ago, like we like to have, and Steve was telling me about his new book. So Steve has a working title, and the title is called. Evolutionary Spirituality, Beautiful, True, and Good. And uh, I was so excited about uh, uh, what Steve was telling me about his new book that I, I stopped our conversation short so we could, ha we could speak about it uh, on, on this new platform. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. No, I've been looking forward to this uh, ever since we had our conversation. Let's take a deep dive into, into the, the, the fundamental ideas behind the new book. And I, th I remember in our last conversation, I think you, you made four fundamental broad distinctions. That, uh, that the, uh, so if you could maybe take us through the four fundamental broad distinctions, which were very, very interesting, mm -hmm. and then explain to us the thesis of the book, what you're trying to accomplish, that would be fantastic. Sure. Well, I'm trying to describe evolutionary spirituality. Um, from my own perspective, I'm trying to, uh, you know, there, there are others like yourself, you know, in, in evolutionary enlightenment, you do a beautiful job of, of describing how the spiritual teachings of evolution illuminate a new kind of spirituality. And so I'm supplementing that. I'm, I'm standing on your shoulders a bit and, and trying to take it a little bit further. Um, and part of it comes from um, my description of what the spiritual teachings of evolution reveal in evolution's purpose. But in Evolution's Purpose, my previous book, that book was aimed at the mainstream. You know, I was really trying to argue to those who were skeptical or otherwise dubious of that that evolution was a spiritual teaching, and and you know that book has served its purpose. But now this book on evolutionary spirituality is is really speaking to people who are already appreciate that spirit is real. In other words, I'm not trying to argue with skeptics or materialists. Um, I'm trying to describe what what the spiritual teachings of evolution are offering. Um, that is fresh and new and exciting. And what goes with that is that what spirit is, is in a sense the presence of the infinite. In other words, we don't have, we, the evolutionary spirituality doesn't have to uh, decide or, or conclude that the source of creativity in the universe is either you know, a loving personal God or an impersonal creative principle. I think that the, the plurality of what ultimate reality is can be retained at the level of evolutionary spirituality. But what we can begin to use do is use the science of spirit, um, the, the, the science of evolution itself, what it discloses about spirituality, to begin to, um, to, to, to make certain conclusions, like that we live in a universe of, of purpose and progress, that, they're, 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 that, that there's a kind of a panentheistic reality that is, that spirit is both imminent and transcendent. That, that the transcendent nature of, of spirit is actually part of it. We're, each of us 
embodies this universal structure in our own lives, right? Just as like we embody all the levels of physical evolution in our bodies, you know, from hydrogen up through uh, all the biological achievements. And we embody in our minds all the stages of consciousness that humanity has gone through since its first emergence. You know, we're using all those stages in a kind of an internal mental ecosystem that makes up our consciousness. We're also, and I think when we come to have a spirit, an experience of spirit, we can also see how we're, we each embody this larger structure of the universe. That is, that there's the infinite, you know, the one, the being, as you described, and then there's the becoming, you know, the finite universe that exists within the infinite, right? And that's this concept of panentheism, that spirit is, is the world, that, that, that spirit is, is emanating from the world, but spirit also transcends the world. It's not just equal to the world. There's a transcendent element, right? The being and the becoming are, are, are one and yet two and yet three. Anyway, um, in the book, the, the, maybe I should sort of go through the organization of it to kind of give a more concrete conception of what I'm teaching here. So after the introduction and explaining integral philosophy and these sort of stages of cultural evolution, sort of a quick primer on evolutionary thinking, chapter uh, two involves uh, um, the challenge of spiritual leadership for the developed world. And there identify three different kinds of, of kind of spiritual teaching. The traditional forms of spirituality, which you recognize as the established religions. What I'm calling secular spirituality, which in a sense is the new atheism and, you know, critical thinking and, and uh, religious naturalism. And, and, and really identifying that much of what science has revealed is a kind of spiritual truth. You know, when you, when you have a, a, the big picture of the universe like this, inevitably it contains not only, um, you know, mundane scientific facts, but also life-changing spiritual truths that we can use for our spiritual growth. So I, I really want to honor and include kind of what I'm calling um, secular spirituality. And there are some secularists like Alain de Vuitton who even understand atheism as a form of spirituality or at least a substitute for spirituality. You know, I, 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 when I was explaining some of, your, uh, some of these distinctions to some, some of my friends, uh, this particular... Uh, this particular idea that there is a form of se that secularism in and of itself ha you know has its own form of spiritual is its own form of spirituality uh, a lot of people found that very interesting but but I understand it because because it because because it because it ex expresses a metaphysical position and a, me and, and a metaphysical conviction that's what makes it a spiritual position it's a description of ultimate reality. Exactly. And the, the meaning of the self. And right? the ultimate and the nature of reality. Of yeah. Even though, you know, the purpose is no purpose. It's all an accident exactly. or just kind of random. <laughs> that's still a metaphysical position no matter what you do. Exactly. But because we can see how science's discovery of the history of evolution, you know, and, and otherwise the scholarship that's brought us to the history of humanity, that these are, you know, again, this forms the foundation of evolutionary spirituality, so we have to recognize how much we've gained from science. And instead of just cherry-picking science or just using it for our purposes in ways that it would not appreciate, like yes. progressive spirituality does, mm -hmm. I think we have to honor secular spirituality for the great achievements in truth that it has, you know, it is Absolutely, it is absolutely. Yeah. So, so, we then, have, of course, so, we have, so we have traditional spirituality, secular right. spirituality, the right. next one was? progressive spirituality which we've been speaking right? about yeah and and that's not just of course the new age um it involves all the contemporary forms of what might be called alternative spirituality or spirituality that has a a postmodern center of gravity even though it might be pre-traditional or traditional or you know that, that is it, these definitions are tricky and it's not, not without some trepidation that i begin to describe these broad outlines but if, if we're going to understand what our opportunities for spiritual evolution are culturally, um, then I think this kind of exercise in charting the cartography of the current cultural state of the marketplace of ideas is a very important you know, uh, a precursor to discovering what our opportunities for further evolution look like. Well, it's also helpful to make these distinctions because it helps us to make sense out of these differing world, these different differing spiritual worldviews that, that, that exist today. That'll help right. us, to, and I think it's part of the idea here is, is it helps to see what the next step actually is. Yeah. So then, after describing what's on offer in the marketplace of ideas, 
you know, there's all these, there, there's millions of people who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. And while some of these people, and, and, and indeed probably the majority of America's youth, and while some of these people can be counted as, a, you know, being participating in progressive spiritual culture and describing themselves spiritual but not religious in that way, that's only a tiny fraction of the millions who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. So I think that these people are saying that they haven't really found any kind of spiritual explanation that appeals to them, but they know that the universe is not just a random accident either. So this is kind of what this culture is calling out for, is, is a, um, a, a more inclusive and a truer explanation of what's spiritually real, and so that's the challenge. Now that leads to the next chapter, chapter three, which is about a, a sort of a, a overview or a description of what um, evolutionary spirituality is. You know, what are its basic tenets? And there I draw on the work of the contemporary teachers of, of evolutionary spirituality, including yourself, and, you know, some of the work that I've done, and of course, Ken Wilber and, and other teachers. Uh, evolutionary spirituality is just emerging now. And there are plenty of, um, of those within progressive spirituality who are using the term evolutionary but nevertheless remaining within the cultural center of gravity. Well, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very aware of that, that, that ever since the, the whole notion or topic of kind of, of, of evolution uh, uh, as, as it relates not to, uh, to, to cosmic evolution or biological evolution or cultural evolution, but spirituality or mysticism has come, has co has come to be shared culturally, I've noticed that there, there are uh, many progressive spiritual teachers that have grabbed on or, and incorporated the the word evolution into their own teaching, but without without in without in in many cases actually understanding the significance of it. So 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 once again, you're making the distinction between traditional spirituality, secular secular spirituality, progressive spirituality, and evolutionary spirituality. Right. Okay. Right. And so the the there's a variety of things that distinguish evolutionary spirituality from progressive spirituality. So I first tackle those with a chapter that sort of is an overview, the rise of evolutionary spirituality I'm calling it, and you know what its basic tenets are. Then that leads to a chapter on uh, I'm you know, calling evolving our understanding of spiritual experience itself, right? And and this chapter um, begins to apply what evolution teaches us about what spirit is. And this teaching comes out of this understanding of this universe structure of being and becoming, right? The, 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 the Big Bang itself inaugurating the emergence of the finite universe and with, with our uh, growing understanding of the evolutionary impulse, as you've been so good at describing, this evolutionary impulse is it gives us a direct phenomenological instruction of the purpose of evolution within us, right? In other words, because we can feel the evolution of the evolutionary impulse, we can feel this impulse within us. This helps us know from the inside what evolution is all about, you know where it's going and, and what it wants, and, and and what our purposes are for participating in it. And so, uh, this then helps us appreciate that spiritual experience, in a sense, is an experience of the being. It's an experience of uh, uh, the infinite that is upholding the finite universe, and that the purpose of the finite universe to add to you know, being through becoming, that that's, in a sense, the purpose of evolution. It's the purpose of spiritual experience, and it's what spiritual experience is. That is, when we have a spiritual experience, we are perfecting the finite universe. We're bringing the infinite into the finite. Or more accurately, we're making the finite translucent, you know, transparent to the infinite that lies underneath. And so, you know, it's through this evolutionary teaching, you know, brought to us by the evolutionary impulse itself, that we can come to understand spirit with a new kind of scientific clarity. You know, again, it's not science, but it is an understanding that's based on these universal structures that are disclosed by science, right? The evolutionary emergence, being and becoming, infinite and finite. So um, spiritual experience then is understood not only as the, the mystics have appreciated it, which is certainly a big part of our understanding of spiritual experience, but we also come to see that intrinsic value right, values such as the beautiful, the true, and the good are forms of spiritual experience also. And so one of the things I hope to do in this chapter on spiritual experience is unify the, the um, well-developed scholarship on spiritual experience that brought to us by many mystics throughout the ages 
with this evolutionary understanding of, of the role of, of the beautiful, the true, and the good as essential elements. And, and, in, your, and in your teaching, in your philosophy, um, the beautiful, the true, and the good represent becoming. <laughs> 